Everything going all right? Welcome back. Uh, a couple of, one, uh, one announcement before I turn it to uh, Ms. Murphy. I know, please listen on this, this is kind of important. Because I know uh, your parents have been concerned about uh, the date for confirmation. Once again, we don't have an answer. Um, the decision comes from the bishop's office. He's coordinating about 80 confirmations, the office. I have a feeling, though, that we will know it by the end of the week. Okay? They're, they're, I know they're at the final stage of checking, make sure that the dates that we requested are accepted. I got a preliminary email from the bishop's office saying, we're checking all the final dates. We'll be back to you right away. So that's all I can tell you at this time. Okay? As soon as I know, the day we know, you will get an email home. Okay, so could you communicate that to your folks, please? The day we know, I promise, we will send an email home with the dates. Okay, there will be, I can tell you for certain, there will be two dates. And we generally divide you up by class, so you can stay with your class for confirmation. I can tell you that. If... One, the date that we assigned to you, you can't do because you've got whatever. I can't imagine anything more important, but you might have something, a tournament or basket weaving or whatever you, you need to do. You could move to the other day with written permission, with written request. But I hope you're not going to do that because then that pulls you away from your class that you've been with some of you for many years. So try to make the effort when we tell you the date to make that date unless there's something major going on. Okay? So please tell your parents we will get that to you the moment we can. Okay? Ms. Murphy. Thanks, Father Steve. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I have just three quick announcements. First, this evening's session, it, we're going to be in the hall here during the session for the entire time. So this is not an evening where at about 45 minutes we break, go into small class sessions. We'll be here with our speaker for the hour and a half. Second is that we have a uh, Sunday 10.30 mass for some of the classes this week. And if you are in these classes, Mrs. House, Mrs. D. Simone, Mrs. Galman, then we ask you to come to um, Mass to be there about 10 o'clock so that we can get everyone organized. Uh, we do have people assigned to different roles and ministries, so if you want to, as students, if you want to know what you will be doing at the Mass and you don't want to wait till Sunday, then please stop by the office at the end of class. But we have, we're all set for Mass. Um, when you get to the church, again, I'll be down in the front, as will Ms. Motel, and uh, we'll make sure that we get you all set up. So, again, if you're Mrs. House of Class, Mrs. D. Simone's, Mrs. Galman's, then we will see you this coming Sunday, 1030 Mass at the church. And last but not least, almost everyone has turned in completed packets. We have one or two students that we're still waiting for something like a, a sponsor for, we don't move forward at this point unless you have that packet to us. So if you have any questions as to whether you've turned in a packet or whether you your forms have arrived, then make sure before you leave here that you stop into the office because we want everybody in great shape for uh, confirmation. I think with that, I will take a moment to just introduce our guest speaker. This is a really special evening for us because each year, annually, at this Confirmation Year 2 program, we invite Mrs. Spear here to present to you a presentation called Vocation of Love. And Mrs. Thayer has been a, is now a retired, but a long-time science teacher for the Boston Public Schools. And probably while she was still working, but also in her retirement as a teacher, she has been working um, as a consultant who comes into parishes such as ours and speaks to 
many different groups, but particularly to confirmation groups. She's got a great presentation for you. I find it always very engaging for students and for adults. Uh, there will be some, if you're thinking that you'll be sitting for the entire hour and a half, you won't because she'll have you uh, doing some movement, moving around. But I think that you'll really enjoy this. I would expect that everyone would be giving your very best respectful listening to Mrs. Thayer. So please give a warm welcome to Mrs. Thayer. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Everything we do in life should begin and end with prayer. So before we do anything else tonight, um, lately when I go out to speak, I try to pray for peace. And I pray for peace in two ways. One is we need peace in our hearts, and it's the peace that only God can give us. And once we have that peace in our hearts, our task as Christians is to bring the peace of God out to the rest of the world. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm very glad to be here tonight. I have two programs that I present to young people. One is on respect for life, but the other one is the one that I'm going to do tonight on respect for love. And everywhere I go, whether I'm speaking about life or whether I'm speaking about love, I try to do everything that I do in the spirit of Jesus. And there are two things that I really admire. There are a lot of things I really admire about Jesus. But two things in particular I'd like to focus on. One is that Jesus always spoke the truth. And, you know, it didn't matter to Jesus whether what he said was popular, whether people agreed with him. And if you've ever really looked at the cross, it really didn't matter to Jesus what it cost him. Right? Jesus was someone who always said what he had to say. But the other thing that I really admire about Jesus is that when Jesus found someone who had lost their way, who had made a mistake, you know, who was in need of kindness and compassion and forgiveness, Jesus was the first one to hold out his hand. And I'm going to talk about some very sensitive issues tonight, but I really want to do it in the spirit of Jesus. And I thought to show how Jesus really handled things, I would begin with a story from the Gospel of John. It's one of my favorites. It says, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and then early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered around him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and they made her stand there before them all. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be put to death. Now what do you say? And they said this to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him. And if you stop to think about it, this is a very, very clever trap in at least three ways. Right? First of all, if Jesus says, go ahead and execute her, right? people are going to say, well, Jesus doesn't have much compassion for people who've made mistakes, even if it's a serious one. Jesus has no compassion. On the other hand, if Jesus says, let her go, then other people are going to say, well, doesn't Jesus really care about what's right and wrong? And not only that, Israel was occupied by the Romans. They were the only ones who could execute someone. So the Pharisees have kind of set Jesus up here. But Jesus bent over and wrote on the ground with his finger. And as they stood there asking him questions, he straightened up and said to them, whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard this, they all left one by one the older ones first. And Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened up and he said to her, where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir, she answered. Well, then Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not sin again. And you know, I think there's an awful lot in that story. 
I would like to ask you just a couple of questions about the story. And as we go through the night, I'm going to ask for a few questions as we go along. If you want to participate, all I'd ask you to, is to raise your hand so that I can see who's talking to me and also just to be respectful when other people are giving an answer. So my first question about the story is what is adultery? What is the big deal in this story? What was this woman doing? What was she doing? Adultery is? She is having an affair. She, she's cheating on her husband. Right? And in Jesus' time, this is a really big deal. What's about to happen to this woman? What's going to happen to her? They're going to put her to death. Now, if you really read between the lines of this story, there is something in this story that is sexist and unfair to women. What is sexist and unfair to women in this story? Way, way down the back, yeah? Well, the woman's getting put to death, but why isn't the guy she's killed? Yeah, yeah, where is he, right? Only the woman is being put to death, at least, you know, at least in the story. But, you know, Jesus is very smart. He understands that the people who are accusing this woman, they're not concerned about her and her soul and what she's doing and why she's doing it. They're just exploiting her to set up a trap for Jesus. So he calls them on it, and he says, if you're perfect, then you can pass the sentence on her. And of course, none of us are perfect, and they all walk away. Now, at the end of the story, Jesus forgives the woman. But forgiveness is not the same thing as approval. How do you know from the story? What's the last thing that Jesus says? Last thing that Jesus says. Last thing that Jesus says? <coughs> Go, but do not sin again. So if you really think about that story, Jesus does two things. He stands for what's right and what's true and what's good, being faithful in a marriage. But he treats people with kindness and love. So again, I'm going to talk about some very sensitive things. Right, but I want to do it in the spirit of Jesus. And I'd like to dedicate this program tonight to two students that I had when I was a teacher in the Boston Public Schools. One was a young man named Carmen. Now, I taught Carmen in the ninth grade. I was his earth science teacher, and I got to know him very well. Carmen went through four years of high school. He graduated. He didn't go to college. He went out and he got a job right away. And one day, he paid me a very fine compliment. He came back to my classroom and he wanted to share with me how his life was going. And so he sat down in one of the student chairs and during the course of the conversation, one of the things that he shared with me was that his girlfriend was pregnant. And to his credit, he was trying to explore with me how he could be a good father to his child and how he could be helpful to his girlfriend. But I always remember what Carmen said. Because he said it out loud, he didn't really say it to me. He said it more to himself. He said, I really don't understand why she is pregnant. After all, we were using protection. And so one of the things that I realized when he said that is that nobody had explained to this young man in a way that was meaningful and real that there is no perfect method of protection. None of them are perfect. And so all of a sudden, this young man is about to become a father. Now the other person <clears throat> that I would like to dedicate this talk to was a young girl named Lucy. Now, I taught Lucy in the 10th grade. I was her biology teacher, and it was kind of when I was a young teacher. My hair wasn't so gray, and I didn't want to be a boring teacher. So I went through the biology books, and I was looking for a chapter in the biology book that I thought would be very interesting to my 10th graders. And in one of the chapters of the book, there were all of these pictures of pregnancy, of the different stages of development of the baby as it grows inside the mother's body. So he said, you know what? Pregnancy is really interesting. I'm going to teach this to my 10th grade class. So on this one particular day, I stood in front of my classroom, and I held up a picture of a developing baby at about six weeks. And I stood there describing, you know, what the baby was like, the, the eyes were developing and the fingers and so on. And as I stood there describing the baby, all of a sudden, I heard a noise down at the back of my classroom. 
And so I looked up, I looked down to the back of my room, and I looked right into the face of Lucy, because she had broken down and begun to cry. I didn't know it, but this particular girl had been pregnant, and in fact, she had just had an abortion. And what I had just done without planning it, and I certainly didn't, didn't mean it this way, what I had just done was place right in front of this girl a picture like her little baby whose life was gone. And she had absolutely no idea because people were saying, it's just a little piece of tissue. And she was young, she was probably scared, so she believed it and she had the abortion. She was so upset that when the bell rang, she stood up, she left my classroom, and I will never forget what she said to her friends when they caught up with her outside. Because she said, if I knew my baby looked like that, she said, I never would have done it. She would have found a different way to deal with her pregnancy. So you know what? These were two really nice young people that I taught when I was in Boston. And you know something? They made serious, life-changing decisions about sex, protection, pregnancy, and abortion. And you know what? Neither one of them, neither one of those two young people had all of the information that they needed to know before they made those decisions. So I'm going to ask you in a minute, here in Mansfield, um, if you had a question about sex, protection, pregnancy, or abortion, who would you ask? Now before you share that with me, I'd like to suggest to you <clears throat> that whoever you ask should pass what I call the three R test. Three R's. The right person is the first R. You can't just ask anybody about these things. The right person is someone who knows you personally and cares about your future. Secondly, make sure whoever you ask has the right information. A lot of people will tell you a lot of different things. Not all of it is accurate. Not all of it is up to date. Sometimes not even all of it is true. And then thirdly, make sure that whoever you ask has the right values, right? The right values, you know, are the things that you believe, the things that are part, part of your faith. Don't let anybody try to talk you into something that you really don't believe. So the three R test, you ask the right person who has the right facts and who has the right values. So I'm gonna ask by show of hands, right? Can somebody tell me, where would you go, who would you ask if you had a question about sex, protection, pregnancy, or abortion? Who would you ask? Or if you don't want to tell me personally, what do you think is the most common answer I get to that question? What do most young people tell me, do you think? We'll have to give service minutes for confirmation if you participate, <laughs> right? Who do you ask? Who could you ask? I'm going to have to pick on people in a minute. Who do you ask? Life's now? All right, let's talk about your parents for a minute, right? Your parents, let's see if they pass the three R test. Do your parents know you and care about you? Yes, they do, right? Parents know you and care about you. All right, secondly, your parents grew up, fell in love, have had children. They know something about sex? Yes? Okay. Thirdly, they send you here, so they share your values. They share your values. The number one answer I get from young people, number one answer is parents. Right? At least 50% of young people will tell me, you know, that they uh, can have this conversation. When I was in high school, I wasn't so lucky. Right? If I mentioned the word sex to my mother, when my mother's face turned red and, you know, she stared at the floor and my mother was not comfortable with this. Later on, though, I had an older sister who was married and so I was able to have some conversation with her. So the number one answer among young people is parents and members of their family. There's at least three other places that people tell me that they can go. Where else do people go, young people go, for information about sexuality? Yes. Shout at me. Doctor. All right, let's talk about doctors, and maybe we'll include nurses and health teachers. We'll kind of put them all together. Does your doctor know you and care about you? Okay. 
Your doctor went to medical school, I hope. So you think your doctor has good information? Okay. But think about this for a minute. Are there some doctors who believe that abortion is okay? Yes, there are some. I don't know about your individual doctor, but there are some. So might you have to be careful about the values? You might have to be careful about values. But you could. You could ask a doctor, you could ask a nurse, you could ask a health teacher. And I'll tell you something about health teachers, though. In the, in the school where I taught, you remember I told you I was sharing pictures of pregnancy? In, in my biology class, I showed those pictures to the health teacher in my school, and he had never seen them, which I thought was kind of unusual. But you could ask a doctor or a nurse or a health teacher. Two other places. Somebody name for me what you think might be a risky place. And I'll give you a clue. It begins with the letter I. It's the second most common answer that I get. Second most common answer. Yes? The internet. All right, let's talk about the internet for a minute. If you go online, now forget for a minute Facebook and Twitter and that stuff, right? If you go online, are you communicating with someone who knows you personally? No. Secondly, if somebody puts up a website, is it automatically up to date or true? No. And thirdly, on the internet, are there Catholic values, Christian values, or anything, uh, any values in the world are out there? Yeah. So I would suggest to you that the Internet is a rather risky place to go. There's one last place that people tell me that they can go. Yep. Friends? All right, let's talk about your friends for a minute, right? Now, your friends know you and care about you? That's kind of the definition of a friend, right? Think about this for a minute. Do you think your friends know more about sex, less about sex, or probably about the same? It depends on who you ask. But let's think for a minute. Let's just pretend that maybe it's about the same, all right? If somebody asks you a question about sex, you don't know the answer, what's the big temptation? Think about, you know, if you're taking a test at school, you don't know the answer. I hope not cheating. I heard that over here, right? Not cheating. But what's the, what's the big temptation? What do we do? What do we do? We guess, right? We guess. So sometimes when people don't know the answer, they try to make something up so they don't look foolish. Third question, among your friends, right, are all your friends Catholic, Christian, or a whole bunch of different values are out there? Some are Catholic, but later on, it's going to be all kinds of values? Probably, right? All I'm suggesting to you, all I'm suggesting to you is when you ask somebody about these very important topics, be very choosy. You can't just ask anybody. Now, I want to say something else, right? Now, anyone in this room was under 70 years old, and that's still me, even though my hair is getting grayer every day. If we're under 70 years old, do you know that we are all different from all the people who ever came before us? Because we have the first two or three generations of people who cannot get through an entire day without being constantly bombarded with messages about sex. Unless you're asleep, unless you're in school, unless I'm working, all day long, we are constantly bombarded with messages about sex. What am I talking about? Where did these messages come from? Right, any, anybody have any ideas? Where did these messages come from? All right, let me ask you a question in reverse. How many people in this room have at least two television sets at home? At least two, all right? Now, I can't believe that there are actually people who count these things for a living, but do you know that if you are an average television watcher, you will see over 10,000 scenes of sex, suggested sex, sexual advertising, and sexual humor in a given year. It's so common that we probably don't even notice it. It's just part of the landscape. How many people here tonight have an iPod? iPod? All right, if I mention names like Madonna and Lady Gaga and a few other folks you all know what I'm talking about. Loaded 
with sexual messages. How many people watch MTV? We got MTV? How many people take in an occasional movie? You go to the movies? Right? Our culture, our culture, our culture is a sex crazy culture. If you watch television and you pay attention almost exclusively to the media, the media would have you believe that the only thing that matters in life is sexual activity. It is obsessed with sex, almost to the point of being abnormal. Why does this culture do this to us? Why do they put so much sexual material in front of us? And it's not because sex is interesting. There's two reasons, two main reasons why this culture is constantly putting sexual imagery in front of us, right? One of those reasons is money. How many people here tonight have ever heard the phrase, sex sells? Would you raise your hand if you've ever heard the phrase, sex sells? All right, one of the reasons, one of the reasons is money. And I can give you an example, I think, to kind of prove that to you. Now, I happen to drive a Toyota. A few months ago, I needed an oil change, so I took the Toyota to the dealership, and I'm sitting in the waiting room around 11 o'clock in the morning while they're working on my car, and right there, big plasma 50-inch screen television, there is a soap opera on with this hot, steamy bedroom sex scene on it. Now, I'm saying to myself, you know, why do they do this, right? Why do they put this as part of the story in such an explicit kind of way? And I would suggest to you that the idea is that I see this sex scene and I'm following the story so that I get hooked on this soap opera. And once I get hooked on this soap opera, every seven minutes they stop the story. Every seven minutes they stop the story to show me a what? They stop the story to show me a commercial. A lot of the idea behind what you're seeing in television is to get you hooked on a program, to get you hooked on the story, so that every seven minutes they stop the story and they want to send you something. The number one reason that drives a lot of the outrageous things that we, on, that we see on television, right, is to make money. That's number one. The second reason is sort of similar, right? Uh, before I give you the second reason, let me ask you a question. How many people here have ever watched the Oscars, the movie awards? Would you raise your hand if you've ever watched them? Well, oh, you guys are up late at night, right? All right? How many of you have ever watched the Grammys? Grammys? The same thing, right? I would suggest to you that the second reason for so much sexual material in our entertainment is fame. A lot of these people are tripping over themselves trying to be a little bit more sensational, a little bit more outrageous, they're trying to outdo each other so that you're going to think that they're bigger, badder, better, and hotter than anything else that's out there. Most of what you experience in the media is driven by money and it's driven by ego. And they really don't care whether or not you get good ideas about love and relationships and what it's all about as long as they make their money, and as long like, as they feel, you know, like they're pretty spectacular. You have to be careful about what you see and what you hear. Now, out of all the sources of information that I have named, out of all the media I have named, I have not named the one true expert on sex. It's not me, right? I have not named the one true expert on sex. Raise your hand if you think you know who the one true expert is. Okay, here's a hint. We're in a religion class. Who is the one true expert on sex? Somebody I haven't heard from. I'll come back to you in a second if I need to. God is the expert on sex. Now, if you stop to think about it, sex is God's idea, isn't it? God is the one who has made us the way we are. Sex is God's idea. And if you wanted to, if you stop to think about it, if, if you invented something, if you invented a new kind of computer chip, a solar-powered car, people would come to you for tech support, wouldn't they? 
So since sex is God's invention, so to speak, we go to God to find out, you know, how, what this gift is really all about. How do we find out what God has to say about things? All right, here's a hint. <clears throat> Number one best-selling book of all time. How do we find out what God has to say about things? You just said it. Hey, the Bible, right? The Bible tells us what God has to say about life. We have the church to help us understand the Bible because the Bible was written for a different culture and a different time. And sometimes our parents can help us when they share the faith. So God is the expert on sex. And we learn through the Bible. How many of us here have a Bible? Raise your hand if you have a Bible. All right, I'm not going to ask you if you read it, but if you got one, that's a good start, right? You know what? I need to stop the talk for a minute and do a commercial. <laughs> I want to do a commercial for the Bible. Because you know something? I found out one day how God absolutely has a way of speaking to us through the Bible. You know, when I first started teaching in Boston, I had a boss, I had a supervisor, and she was a very remarkable person. She got everybody in the science department to do their best work, and you know something? She never yelled at anybody. I don't know how she did it, but she expected the best, and we did the best. We gave her our best work. However, one day, I was sitting in the teacher's room with all of my teacher friends. My supervisor came in, and I must have said something that she really didn't like. And right there in front of all my friends, she put me down big time, and I was thoroughly embarrassed. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this, when you're somewhere with your friends, and something happens, and you're really upset and you want to cry, and you can't because you're in front of other people. That's how I felt. Anyway, the bell rang, and I went back into my classroom. I had two classes to teach. I didn't want to cry in front of my students. I get into my car at the end of the day. I didn't want to cry while I was driving, not the kind of day I was having. But I drove past my church, and the door was open. And I said to myself, you know, I can't stand this feeling anymore. So I parked the car, I went into the church, sat down on the bench, and I finally just cried and got it out of my system. But after that happened, I picked up the missalette, you know the book that's in the bench? I picked up the missalette, and the book fell open. True story, you won't believe what I read. Because right there in front of me it said, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and those who are crushed, he saves. And in that moment, I knew that God was saying to me, Linda, I don't care who hurts you. I am your God, I am your best friend, and I will never leave you. And so God has a way of doing that, of speaking to us through the Bible. Anyway, I would like to share with you four ideas from the Bible. They all come from the first book of the Bible. Who knows the name of the first book of the Bible? First book of the Bible is the book of Genesis. All right, they all come from the story of creation. Now, before I share these four big ideas with you, anybody want to raise a hand and tell me, what do you think that God might have to say about sex, for heaven's sake? For heaven's sake. <laughs> okay, part of it is about the creation of children. Anybody else have any ideas? All right, I'm going to give you four big ideas. Here's idea number one. It says in the Bible that God made man, meaning mankind, people. God made man in his image. Male and female, he created them. I don't know what you just heard when I said that. God has made you and I in his image. Every single one of you here tonight is made in the image and likeness of Almighty God. Every single one of you is made to be an imitation of God in the way that you live and in the way that you love because you are made in God's image. God has a time and a place for you, for you to share the love of God, and it's his gift to you. You are made in God's image. And not only are you made in God's image, but you are made in God's image as either male or female. 
And because we are made in God's image, male, of, male and female, do you know what that really means? I'm going to say something really radical here, and I'm going to beg you money that you've never heard this before. You're probably never going to hear this again. But because we are made in God's image, male and female, it means that there is something about sex that should remind us of God, which is probably a very unusual statement to make. But I believe that that's absolutely true. Because we are made in God's image, male and female, there is something about sex that should remind us of God. And I believe that's true. You know, I don't know how you think about God, but I'll tell you how I think about God. I've been thinking about God all my life. And I don't know who God is for you, but I'm going to tell you who God is for me. For me, God is the pure love who has given life to everything. God is the pure love who gives life. Do you ever think about it? You know, when you leave this hall tonight, every star that you see in that sky, every tree, every blade of grass, every creature, every person has life for one reason. God had so much love that it exploded into the creation of everything that we know. God is the love who gives life. And so too, when a husband and wife make love, they give life to each other, and they can actually give life to the baby. And so the very first thing that God is telling us about sex is that sex is a sacred gift. It tells us something about God. Do you know the second idea is like it? Do you know the second idea in the Bible? When God creates Adam and Eve, do you know what God says to Adam and Eve? God says, be fertile and multiply. And what God is saying to Adam and Eve is, I want you to make love, and I want you to bring children into my world. Do you know that the very first blessing, the very first blessing in our Bible is the blessing of children, and children are the result of sexual love. So the second thing that God is telling us about our sexuality, first is sacred, and second is life-giving. And one of the saddest things to me about living in America today is that a lot of people pretend that children are accidents. A lot of people pretend, a lot of people pretend, you know, that children are not supposed to happen. Hollywood pretends that children are not part of what is supposed to happen. And I think I can prove that to you. How many people here tonight, how many of you would you raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie Titanic? It's on TV a lot. I guarantee you on Super Bowl Sunday, some station is going to put Titanic on so that people who don't like football are going to watch something else. I have to tell you, I really loved the movie Titanic. I have a confession to make. I don't know if Father is still here. Please don't tell anybody this. When that movie first came out, <clears throat> I'm a really romantic person. I didn't see that movie once or twice. I actually went to see that movie eight times. That's pretty sad, isn't it? I went to see that movie eight times. It's a three-hour movie. Eight times three is how many hours? 24. I have spent a whole day of my life, I've spent a whole day of my life watching the movie Titanic. Now, I'd like to tell you, first of all, what I really liked about that movie, and then I'd like to tell you something that I have a bit of a reservation about. Here's what I liked about that movie. At the end of that movie, Jack, who I think is the hero of the movie, Jack does something that should remind us of Jesus. To raise your hand, somebody who thinks they can tell me, what does Jack do at the end of that movie that should remind us of Christ? What does Jack do that should remind us of Christ? Way down the back. He sacrifices himself for love. He sacrifices, <laughs> not exactly, he sacrifices, he sacrifices himself for someone. Not for love, but for someone. At the end of that story, when the ship goes down, there's that floating object on the water. It's only going to hold one person. Jack gets off and he dies from cold and exposure in the water, and Rose is saved, 
right? Rose is saved. Now, actually, when I left the movies that night, I wasn't listening to Celine Dion and her heart goes on. I had the words of Jesus in my head. Do you know what Jesus says? Jesus says that no one has greater love than the man or the woman who gives up life itself for somebody else. Now, that's what I really liked about that movie. However, halfway through the movie, Jack and Rose do something that is not exactly Christ-like. They're in the back seat of that car, they're down in the hold of that ship, and they make love. Now, I just got finished telling you that sex is a sacred gift, and it is. But there is something that is not sacred about what Jack and Rose are doing. Jack and Rose have not made godlike promises of love to each other. Jack and Rose are not what? They're not married, right? All right, but here's my question. I would like everybody to be honest. You'd be honest anyway. Can anybody tell me, right, when you watch that sex scene in that movie, how many of you would you raise your hand if your first thought was, I bet right now Rose is becoming pregnant? Nobody. Because everyone in this room, myself included, we have all been brainwashed by Hollywood to believe that sex has no consequences. But you know what? In real life, right at that, re that very moment, Rose and Jack could have started a baby because God says that sex is life-giving. So two ideas so far. First, sex is sacred. Sex is life-giving. Third idea is this. God makes Adam first. God puts Adam in paradise. He's in the Garden of Eden. And Adam should be perfectly happy. He has mountains, lakes, streams, sunrises, sunsets, all kinds of creatures. And you know something? God looks at Adam, and Adam isn't happy. Because even though Adam is in paradise, Adam has no one to share his life and his love with. No one who is, you know, like himself. So God says, it isn't good that the man is alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. And so God creates Eve, right? God creates Eve. So the third thing that God is telling us about sex is that sex is about intimate love. Human sexuality is one of God's answers to the deepest longing inside of everyone not to go through life alone, intimate love. What's an intimate relationship? An intimate relationship is deeply personal and it is exclusive, right? This relationship is just for these two people, intimate love. Now, I'm going to say something now that some people consider controversial, but when I say it, I hope you realize that I'm saying it, you know, um, not to pick on anybody and not to be mean, but we're living in a culture right now that is debating the whole issue of gay marriage. Would you raise your hand if you've heard something on the news or somewhere about gay marriage? Okay. I want you to think about something for a minute. When God says, it isn't good that the man is alone, I will make a suitable partner for him, God does not create another man. God creates a woman. And part of the reason is that only a man and a woman can create a child together, right? Only a man and a woman can create the future. That's why society supports the relationship between a man and a woman. Marriage is not about any two people who happen to love each other. Marriage is about those two people, mainly, who love each other and can create the future. Now, how many people would agree with this, right? God loves everybody no matter what. True? Raise your hand if you would agree with that. All right, so that means if you ever happen to know someone who is gay, you treat them with the love of Christ because sometimes people in that lifestyle suffer terribly. Right? But marriage itself is between a man and a woman. So God says three things so far. Sacred, life-giving, intimate love. And the last thing is this. At the end of that scene in the Bible, it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife, and the two 
become one flesh. Man leaves father and mother, clings to the wife, and two become one flesh. You know, up until the time people marry, how many of us would like to get married someday? Would you raise your hand if you want to get married someday? How many of us want kids? Want kids? Right? Right? Up until the time that people marry, usually the closest relationship they have is with their family at home. After they marry, though, that changes. Husband and wife become number one to each other. But it says something else. It says that a man clings to his wife. It does not say that a man clings to his girlfriend. I wonder if somebody can tell me, and again, raise your hand if you think you know. I would like to know, what is the big difference between a girlfriend and a wife? What is the big difference between a boyfriend and a husband? What is the critical difference? All right, well, what makes a marriage a marriage? You're on the right track. What makes a marriage a marriage? I'm looking for a very particular word. All right, let me see if we can give away a little bribe here. Let's see if somebody can come up with the right word. I have a nice picture of Abraham Lincoln. I will part with $5 if I can find someone who has the exact word that I'm looking for. Over here. What is it? The question is, what is the difference between a girlfriend and a wife or a boyfriend and a husband? Uh, you already had one shot. I'll come back to you, though. We're going to talk about love later. Say it nice and loud. What's your name? Laura Give it up for Laura. She says a commitment. They're committed to each other. The big difference between... I might try another question later. The big difference, the big difference between a girlfriend and a wife, a boyfriend and a husband, is the level of commitment that they bring to that relationship. Because you might not need me to tell you this, but when it comes to sex, there are two kinds of relationships in this world. One kind of a real, real you know, one kind of relationship is a commitment, a marriage. However, there is another kind of sexual relationship. It has a funny nickname, but I have to tell you, in a way, it's really not a very funny thing, right? The name of the relationship that is the opposite of marriage is pizza love. I bet in your health class, nobody has ever taught you about pizza love. Let me see if I can describe pizza love for you and you see if you recognize it. Now I happen to live in Marshfield. It's a nice oceanside town and in the center of the town we have a nice little pizza shop with an original name. Marshfield's Famous Pizza. Pizza love goes something like this. I'm walking down Ocean Street and I look in that window they're making pizza, and boy, that pizza looks so good. That pizza looks so fun. I can smell that pizza. I can almost taste that pizza. All I can think about is pizza. I gotta have some pizza. So you know what? I go into that pizza shop. I spend some money on pizza. I spend some time with pizza. You can tell by my great figure, pizza spends a lot of time with me. And I get deeply involved with pizza. But I have to tell you something else. After a while, pizza doesn't make me happy. I might get a little bit of indigestion. I might smell some Chinese food from down the street. And you know something? The minute that pizza doesn't make me happy, I take that pizza, I put it in a cold, dark corner of my refrigerator, or I dump it, maybe I move on to that Chinese food. Now, you might not need me to tell you this, but unfortunately, when it comes to sex, there are some people who treat other people no different than a piece of pizza. They meet someone, 
They're attracted to someone. They spend time with that person, maybe spend a little bit of money on that person. They get deeply involved, and they might even have a sexual relationship. But the minute that something goes wrong, and I have to tell you this statistically, the average teenage sexual relationship doesn't last more than about six months, because there's no commitment. The minute that the feelings change, maybe this couple has a big argument. Maybe one person spies another person who's just a little bit more interesting. And the minute that the feelings change because there is no commitment, one person dumps the other person and moves on to somebody else. And if you have ever seen that happen, sometimes it's one of the most devastating experiences that a young person can have. Do you know why? Sometimes young people are a little bit lonely. Sometimes they feel like maybe they don't fit in. And along comes somebody, you know, who says, I love you. And for the first time in their life, they feel special, they feel important, they get involved with this person, and maybe they give them everything. But when something goes wrong and the feelings change, right, and that other person you know, who said, I love you, walks away. The original person who felt so lonely and out of touch with everybody else, they end up feeling worse than they did in the beginning. They end up feeling used. And if you've ever seen that happen, it's really a sad kind of thing. Now, I have to tell you something else, and again, you might not need me to tell you this, but unfortunately, there are people in this world who are only interested in a sexual experience and they lie about love. And up until this point in the talk, you might have noticed that I haven't used the word sin. But I'm going to use the word sin here, right? Because there are people who lie about love, they use somebody for sex, and then they throw them away. That's exploitation, and I'm here to tell you that it's sinful and it's wrong to do that because everyone in this room is made in whose image? Everybody in this room is made in God's image. And God did not make anyone to be used like that and then thrown away. Now, the opposite, the opposite of pizza love is a commitment of marriage. How many of you would like to get married someday? Raise your hand if you'd like to get married someday. You know what? I love weddings. I'm a really romantic person. Let's have a wedding tonight. Want to have a wedding tonight? Let's have a wedding tonight. I need someone to be a volunteer groom and a volunteer bride. One volunteer. <laughs> Excuse me, let me warn you. If anybody here points to somebody else and tries to volunteer somebody else, I will pick the pointer instead. So please do not do that to other people. It's not nice. Volunteer bride, step right this way. One volunteer groom. I need a volunteer groom. You know, I need a volunteer groom. Get a service minute for confirmation. I'm going to have to pick some poor groom. All right, step right this way. Excuse me. Everybody is going to be respectful here, right? That's the name of the game. Your name is Pete. Your first name? Peterson. Okay, and you are? Carolyn, all right. I will require two things from everybody else here. These two people are doing me a favor by volunteering to do this, so I want the utmost respect for them. Secondly, what I, and most important, I want you to think about what you're going to say to someone on your wedding day, all right? So, you're not gonna hold that on your wedding day. Put it behind your bouquet here. Okay, all right. So you're gonna repeat after me, all right? I, Peterson, take you, Carolyn, to be my wife from this day, excuse me, respect is the name of the game, right? To be my wife from this day forward, for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, uh-oh. You know what? She just lost all that beautiful hair. She's on chemotherapy. You're still going to say, in sickness and in health, till? Till death do us part. See, he knows. 
the love that he's promising is so pure and so godlike, nothing will break this promise except death itself. Are you going to repeat after me? Okay. I, Carolyn, take you, Peterson, to be my husband from this day forward, for better or worse, for richer or poorer. Stop everything. He just lost his job. He's on unemployment. For richer or poorer. This is good. In sickness and in health. Till. Till. Till death do us part. Got to say it. Till death do us part. The love that she is promising to him is such a pure imitation of God that nothing is going to break this promise of love except death itself. All right, by the power, oh no, I can't do that. Why don't you two have a seat, the rest of you give it up for a couple of minutes. All right, now, why did I do that? Besides the fact that I'm a very romantic person and I really like weddings. You know, I have to tell you, I don't know what your family is like. I've been to a lot of weddings in my family, and I've listened to members of my family say all these beautiful marriage vows, and then my family fights about everything. I mean, you name it, my family fights about it. Why are you late coming home from work? You forgot to pick up a gallon of milk. You've got to pick up, you know, Joe from, from soccer practice. We can't afford to go on vacation. You name it, my family fights about it. But... On their wedding day, they made those promises, you know, they stuck to those promises, they prayed, and for most of my family, their marriages are still working. However, I have to say something else. I have been to some other weddings, I have heard people say those vows, and then for reasons that God alone knows, I do have people in my life who haven't been able to make their marriages work. And I'm not here tonight to pick on anyone you know, has seen a broken marriage because it's very painful and it's not really what God wants. But I'm here to tell you this tonight. On your wedding day, when you say those words, you are supposed to mean them to the bottom of your heart. You know, you say those words, you mean them to the bottom of your heart because you know something? Right now, there is somebody who already loves you for better or worse, no matter what you do. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're sick or healthy. And that person, of course, is Almighty God. So that on your wedding day, when you say those words to someone, do you know what you're promising that person? You're saying to them, I am going to love you with a God-like love. I'm going to love you with a love that imitates the love of God himself. That's why marriage is not a contract. Marriage is not a piece of paper. It's not a lovely dress and a wedding ring. Marriage is a sacrament. It's something holy. That man and that woman are promising to give themselves to each other with a love that imitates the love of God himself. So, if you believe in the ways of God, that means if you believe that sex is something sacred, life-giving, about intimate love, and a sign of commitment, you only have to remember one rule about sexual activity. Raise your hand if you think you know the one rule about sexual activity. Right, somebody, some, someone I haven't heard from. One rule about sexual activity. All right, let me ask you the question in reverse. Would you raise your hand if you have ever heard that you are supposed to wait until you marry? Would you raise your hand if you've at least heard that rule? All right. <clears throat> How many people would agree with me that in American culture, that rule, to wait until you marry, is a difficult rule? How many people agree with that, that that's kind of a difficult rule? Because I think it is, all right, in our culture. So I have to ask you this question. What is the matter with God? You know, God gives us this really great gift, our sexuality, and then he says, you know what? you got to wait. What's up with that? Why, why would God do that? I would suggest to you that any time God gives you a really, really difficult rule, it's for two reasons. One is he wants to protect you, and the other is that he wants you to be fulfilled. God wants to protect you, 
and he wants you to be fulfilled. I'm going to ask you five or six questions here, and you know what? You don't have to answer them. But I really hope you think very seriously about them. Because I want to prove to you, if I can, that God is not a cosmic killjoy. God is your best friend. So here's question number one. How many people think that God would like them to be exposed to the AIDS virus, HIV? How many people have heard or studied a little bit about AIDS? Would you raise your hand if you've studied or heard a little bit about AIDS? Right, AIDS is a virus. It's transmitted between people during sexual relations. Right, there's no cure. Right, people have it for life. There are some drugs to slow it down. But if you have AIDS, you have it attacks your immune system, and you can pick up any other disease in a fatal kind of way. And I have to tell you something. I have three people in my life who died of AIDS. They were young, they were good people, and they're gone. Second question. How many people think that God would like them to be exposed to one of the 25 other sexually transmitted diseases? Would you raise your hand if you've studied some of these in school? Because I know some schools do, some don't. All right, let me just explain a little bit about sexually transmitted diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases are caused by germs that live either in or near the private parts of the body, right? And you get these diseases by having sex with someone who is infected. Now, I don't want to make this a whole night about diseases, but I would like to share with you two of them that are very common in the Boston area. One is a sexually transmitted disease that has kind of a funny name, an odd name, but it's really not funny. There is a disease called herpes. Herpes is caused by a virus. It lives either in or near the private parts of the body. If you have sex with someone who has herpes, you get that virus and you have it for the rest of your life. And it means that three, four, five times a year, you're going to break out in blisters and sores in the private areas of your body. If you are a woman, and you get herpes, and you develop these sores during a pregnancy, during the delivery of a baby, you can actually give herpes to your baby, who will then suffer brain damage, right? Herpes can be spread by oral contact, right? Um, some people will try to tell you, how many of you have heard something called safe sex? Would you raise your hand if you've heard something about safe sex, protection, condoms? Right, piece of plastic the man wears during sexual relations to prevent fluids from passing between people. A condom does not cover all of the places where the herpes virus lives. Sometimes it can be spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. There is an epidemic of herpes out there. At least one out of five sexually active people is carrying herpes. Right? Now the other disease which has spiked recently in the greater Boston area, is a disease called chlamydia. Chlamydia is a bacterium. It lives in or near the private parts of the body, and it's spread by having sexual relations. Now, there is a cure for chlamydia, but unfortunately, a lot of people don't go to get an antibiotic because chlamydia is a sneaky disease. Right? If you get a chlamydia infection, you might have symptoms. Right? You might have a burning sensation when you go to the bathroom. You might have a discharge. After three weeks, the symptoms go away, but the germ is still there. And so people continue to pass the chlamydia bacteria around. Now, if you get a chlamydia infection, especially for women, occasionally for men, if you have an untreated infection, you can suffer something called pelvic inflammatory disease, and if it goes untreated, you have a one in five chance that you will not be able to have a baby. These are nasty diseases. It's not what God wants for you. So God doesn't want you to be exposed to AIDS or these diseases. Let me ask you another question. How many people think that God would like you either to become pregnant or get a girl pregnant before you're ready for parenthood? How many people think that God would like you to be tempted to have an abortion? 
How many people think that God would like you to struggle as a single parent? My brother was a single parent, but it was, it was very difficult, but he did it as best that he could. How many people think that God would like you to be used for sex, pizza love, and then thrown away? How many people think that God would like you to find a faithful partner and be fulfilled for as long as you both shall live? That's what God wants for you. Do you ever stop to think about this? <clears throat> Do you know that the person that you are going to marry is probably alive right now? That person is probably alive right now. And do you know what you're supposed to do during your teenage years? Do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to practice being faithful to your future marriage partner. Because you know what? Being faithful isn't always easy. Everybody is tempted. You're supposed to practice being faithful. You want to give yourself brand new to someone on your wedding night. A gift, right? So God says, sacred, life-giving, intimate love, a sign of commitment, and that this is about a very holy thing. I have um, three more topics. I want to go back to the topic of AIDS for a minute. Would you raise your hand again, if those of you who have heard about AIDS, the AIDS virus? Okay. What's the best protection? It's a word that begins with the letter A. Best protection is? Abstinence. All right, abstinence. It means you're not having sexual relations, right? It also means that you're probably abstaining from drugs and alcohol. Most people who make their first mistake about sex make it while they're under the influence of either drugs or alcohol. But you know what? God has given us hormones. God has given us a sex drive. God has created us to seek out a life partner. God does not intend for most of us to abstain for a lifetime. So can somebody tell me what's the second best protection against these diseases? I already mentioned it. Some people will tell you how many people have heard of safe sex protection of condoms, right? A lot of people will tell you that that's the answer. Can anybody tell me, are condoms 100% effective? No. Um, in, in order to prevent a pregnancy, and again, a man wears a condom over his sex organ during intercourse, the idea is that fluids do not pass between people, right? When young people use a condom to prevent a pregnancy, right, condoms are about 80% effective. Now, 80%, if you got an 80 on a test, what's that, about a B minus? About a B minus? How many people like to get a B minus? B minus is pretty good? All right, I'd like to show you, though, that when it comes to sexual activity, you want to think twice about that B minus. I wonder if I could have three or four teachers help me to give everybody in the room one of these cards. Can I have a couple of teachers help me get these out. If you put a bunch of cards on the end of the row, people can pass them across. <laughs> All right, any extras you can give to me? Extras? We miss a few. It's coming, they're coming this way. Everybody needs a card.
All right, would everybody please stand up? All right, please listen carefully. I would like you to pretend that you are 18, you have just graduated from high school, and your parents are so proud of you because you have just won a full scholarship to Notre Dame University out in Indiana. They're going to pay for everything, <coughs> tuition, books, dormitory, meals, everything, right? Your parents are thrilled. You couldn't be happier. In September, you go out to Indiana for what they call orientation. They want to show you where your dorm is and where the cap is, where the gym is, and so on. And while you're there, you meet and fall in love with the partner of your dreams. You've never felt this way before. You can hardly wait to get up in the morning. You're going to be texting each other from the back of the classroom, driving your teachers crazy. You're going to go to basketball games and football games, and everything about your world is perfect. You have never felt this way before. Now, let's say that you're in a long-term relationship with this person, well, for heaven's sake, you've been seeing each other for about three or four weeks. <laughs> and the question happens, it always will. It's part of human nature. The question is, am I going to have sex with this person? And you decide that this feeling of love is so beautiful that the answer is yes. However, you're worried about pregnancy. You don't want to ruin your scholarship. You're not ready to start a baby. So you remember what people have told you about safe sex. You go down to the drugstore and you get a supply of condoms. Now, unfortunately, what they don't tell you, and they should print this on every condom package, is this statistic. When young people use a condom to prevent a baby, 80% will not start a baby but 20%, one out of five, will actually start a baby in the first year or year and a half. Now, no liars. I want you to look at your index card. If you have the number one on your card, you can sit down. You're not pregnant. Your girlfriend isn't pregnant. If you have the number five, be seated. No baby. Should you be tested for AIDS? 
If a condom lets you down with respect to pregnancy, it can also let you down with respect to AIDS. Now, I don't like to leave anybody out. Some of you who are in your seat, I have a bad piece of news for you. Everybody that you see standing made a condom mistake at the time of the month when the woman's egg can be fertilized. You know, a woman has a monthly cycle. There's about four or five days, maybe six, when the egg can be fertilized, right? However, the other 23 days, you can still make a condom mistake, but there's no egg, all right? So if you have the number one, would you please stand up? You had one condom mistake this year. If you have the number five, stand up. Everybody, please listen. I'm really trying to spare you some unhappiness. Everybody that you see standing needs to see a doctor because depending on who your partner was, you might have been exposed to AIDS, herpes, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and all those nasty sexually transmitted diseases. You need to see a doctor. Now, I still don't like to leave anybody out. Anybody that's still seated, you need to think about something, too. All of the people who are standing made a mistake this year. A few of you are going to make a mistake next year. All right, would you please be seated and very quickly pass these cards towards the center, real quick. Towards the center, this way. All right, please, while you're doing that, I have two more quick topics. So please listen. Thank you. Sometimes people say to me, what if two people really love each other? Why can't they have sex if they really love each other? And it's an important question, and there is an answer to it. The answer is that not all I love yous are the same. We use the word love a lot. I love that dress, I love that car, I love pizza, I love the Patriots, I love snow, and I love you. We use the word love a lot, right? A lot of different ways. Right? When people say I love you, they're not always talking about the same thing. Love is a misused word. I would suggest to you that there are three kinds of I love you's. One is an I love you of attraction. That's when people say I love you, and they say the same way that they say I love that car, I love that dress. It means that there is something about that person that makes me want to draw close. Now attraction is not exactly love. Attraction makes me feel good. Love is supposed to make somebody else feel happy, feel good. But attraction isn't a bad thing. Most relationships begin with attraction, don't they? There's just something about that other person. But attraction, even when it's strong, is not enough to have a sexual relationship. You know why? You're going to be attracted to a lot of different people, and feelings of attraction change. How many people have ever watched a TV show where one character says, what did I ever see in him or her? How many people have ever heard that, right? Feelings of attraction can change. The second kind of I love you is an I love you of affection and caring. This is when somebody else's happiness is important to you. And it's a better kind of I love you. It's an I love you for a friend, maybe I love you for a brother, something like that. Even though this is a better kind of I love you, it's still not enough to have a sexual relationship. God asks us to share affection and caring with all the people that he puts into our lives. So it's not enough. Third kind of I love you is when you say to someone, I want to give myself to you the way that God gives. And that person wants to give back. You make a gift of yourself, a commitment. It's only when you reach that level where you really want to give yourself completely to someone in marriage that it's worthy of a sexual relationship. And of course, I do have to mention once again, there are a lot of people who lie about love, unfortunately. But attraction, still not enough. Affection is better, still not enough. But when you really want to give yourself to someone the way that God gives, 
then it's worthy of a sexual relationship. Last thing I want to talk about is sexual pressure. If you have not experienced it, you will. It comes from two places. We experience sexual pressure from inside of us. God has given us a sex drive. He has created us to find a life partner, right? We want to belong to somebody. Those are powerful feelings, and we really need to learn how to manage them. However, there are pressures that come from outside of us, right? The media is pressure. The media would have you believe that unless you're having sex at every opportunity, there's something wrong with you, right? There's pressure in the locker room. Somebody's going to ask you, have you done it yet? And if you say no, I plan to wait, some people are going to try to make you feel as if there's something wrong with you. And I have to tell you, and there's a word for people who do that. People who try to make you miserable for your sexual choice to wait are called bullies. And it's a form of sexual harassment. Nobody has the right to make fun of your decision. That's between you and God and whoever you're relating to, right? Somebody takes you out, spends some money on you, right? Somebody gives you an expensive Christmas present and then they're looking for something sexual later on, right? You know, when somebody gives you a gift, the only thing they should ask for in return is a look of happiness on your face. Because if they're looking for something sexual in exchange for money spent, they're trying to buy something. Right, somebody might say to you, if you don't do this with me, we're going to break up. How many people think that that sounds like love? How many people think that that sounds like a threat? Because that's exactly what it is. If somebody is putting you under sexual pressure, and you're having a hard time dealing with it, you need to talk to an address, a trusted adult. You, you know, um, you need to think ahead of time about what you're going to say to someone. And you know, once you make your wishes known, if you say, no, I'm not ready, right, and somebody keeps pushing you, that's harassment too. And people aren't respecting you when they do that, right? And please always, always remember that the use of force with respect to sex is a crime. And if it ever happens to someone that you know, you know, it needs to be reported to a trusted adult and to the legal authorities. Right? Nobody has the right to force you into something that you really don't want to do. God has given you something very precious and very beautiful. Right? If you use it according to God's plan, you're going to avoid an awful lot of problems in life. Because remember, real happiness comes when you find someone that you want to give yourself to and love, and they want to return the gift. Because that's what it's really about, about two people who love each other in a godly way. Now, I've just given you an awful lot of good information, hopefully, right? And it's a lot to remember. So we've put all this information in a book. The books have been great, you know, graciously someone has paid for the books. So I wonder if I could find, you know, four or five teachers again to help me give out the books. And I'd like to close with a reflection and then we'll be done. All right, so if I could have a few people to help me give out the books. There's some in the box over there. This slipper is